Thanks, Morgan. And thanks, Terry, very much for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about size matters and the uh, what's likely to happen to the Great Barrier Reef megafauna. So why does size matter? Well, I, I guess Daniel gave, us a, gave me a very good introduction there when he introduced the Great Eight. Um, but there are a series of reasons. There are ecological reasons, uh, the megafauna are at the top of food chains, or even when they're uh, herbivores like, like dugongs, they're moving incredible amounts of, uh, disturbing incredible amounts of structuring species, seagrasses. Uh, my back of the envelope calculations suggested, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of tonnes per year. They also have very significant social, cultural and dietary values. So Daniel talked about some of the social values to the broader Australian community. They also have very significant cultural values to Indigenous Australians and dietary values to, pe to Indigenous Australians living in remote areas. They have economic values, both for tourism and fishing. And lastly, they have legal values, and John introduced the concept of, under the EPBC Act, of matters of national environment significance. And I think it's important to recognise that of the triggers for federal intervention uh, in major developments in, in, under the EPBC Act, seven of the 10 threatened species that, uh, that trigger the act the most occur in the Great Barrier Reef region and their megafauna. So we have a, the Great Barrier Reef supports a very diverse megafauna, many uh, marine mammals, six of the seven world species of sea turtle and many sharks and rays. Now the species I've illustrated here are all oceanic species that come in and out of the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area and their future is probably going to depend on things that happen outside the area. Today I want to talk about for, as an example, three species where what happens to them within the Great Barrier Reef uh, Marie, uh, World Heritage Area is dependent on what we do inside that area. So my first example is the dugong, which uh, scrubs the seagrass, uh, even quite low density seagrass, a bit like a floor polisher. On, the, uh, on your I'm always bad at this. Right hand side, uh, you can see a spatial model that uh, Lana Gretsch uh, et al created based on 25 years of aerial surveys. There's a couple of things I want you to get out of this. Red and, and dark red are very high densities and you can see that in the north there is a lot remaining of high density dugong habitat uh, which supports thousands of animals. And our 25 years of aerial survey haven't detected a significant decline, although I want to say rather worryingly, the last survey that we did last year was the lowest number that we've ever, uh, ever got, but it's not significantly lower given the uncertainty. But I think there's a sniff of a problem there. If I look at the urban coast, however, you can see that there are uh, very few red areas left. Was it always like this? Perhaps it was always lower. But if you look at, the, at that graph there, and the y-axis is dugongs caught per month per beach, and, and the um, x-axis is time, you can see there was a dramatic decline in the catch per unit effort uh, from about the 1960s when shark nets were set for bather protection. Now, all this decline is not due to that. Then it kind of levelled out and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority introduced some fishing restrictions and it looked like it was stabilising at a low level and that's what our aerial survey results showed as well. And then we had the extreme weather events of 2010 and 2011. So we had Cyclone Yasi, we had huge floods, 
uh, flood plumes, the sorts of things John talked about, and we had seagrass beds absolutely devastated. Now, this came on top of a series of wet seasons. And so the first, and of course, some impacts just continued because you, we weren't going to stop uh, major port developments and dredging programs. And I appreciate these things are, are pretty unstoppable there because uh, the lead times are so huge. And dugongs died. So this graph is the cumulative totals of dugongs uh, across a year, and this is the number of strandings in various years, and this is 2000, the top line is 2011 in comparison to all the other years. Now, this is certainly not all the dugongs that died in the Great Barrier Reef because this is a stranding program which picks up animals that die in places handy to people, and even in the urban coast, there are huge stretches where nobody goes. So this is definitely underestimating the problem. The modelling that's been done on this would show that the overwhelming problem actually is the extreme weather event that year. Dugongs also moved. And how much they died and how much they moved, I don't know. We don't have enough data. Uh, it, it, if you look at these two uh, maps here, which are uh, spatial models created from aerial survey results, and you can see that dark blue and pink are areas of high density. These are hot, uh, hot spots, sorry, Hugh. And, um, and you can see that there's a very big difference between 2005 and 2011. And for the first time since we started monitoring, the numbers were significantly lower in the, great, in the Southern Great Barrier Reef than ever before. More worrying, we did not see a single calf, which indicates that the animals had stopped breeding. So the situ anecdotal data would suggest this situation is, has recovered a bit, which means animals would have had to have moved back. Uh, because some of them will have moved. We know that from satellite tracking. They can move hundreds of kilometres. But we all, and I agree, at this stage, the data are not there to separate temporary emigration from death, but we know both were happening. The situation in my next example, the snubfin dolphin, has some parallels to that for the dugong, but it's much less well known. So this is a new species of dolphin. It was, it was described first in 2005. This was the first new small cetacean that had been described in the world for 25 years. We know from anecdotal evidence and also habitat modeling that they should be all along the coast. Now they're occurring in very few places. Those X's uh, represent the places, the size of the X is significant. They are now occurring in very small, genetically isolated populations, mainly less than 100 animals, and the population modelling shows they can sustain mortality, human-induced mortality, because they're long-lived and slow breeding like dugongs of only an individual animal every few years. But they, there is an under-reported killer, which is gill nets. And these two animals here were recovered in the last couple of years close to Townsville, uh, attached to a block. The fishermen know it's wrong. They know they shouldn't do it. But we don't even know enough about where these animals are to be sure that the um, zoning protection that had, was put in place when the reef was rezoned uh, in 2004 that was designed to protect dugongs, we have no idea how good this is for dolphins because we literally don't know much about them. So we potentially have a species of dolphin that may disappear from the Great Barrier Reef before we even really know it's properly there. There is very limited protection in this increasingly developed environment. 
One of the things that's very unfortunate about these dolphins is that they quite like the sorts of areas that have been developed as ports. And there is um, some evidence from other places and a closely related species in Southeast Asia which suggests there's an affinity for river mouths, which is, of course, where ports tended to have been developed. And this is an unfortunate habit for this dolphin. One of the things that I think is very worrying is that one of the few good remaining populations, see that black circle, is a place where there may be a new port in the Great Barrier Reef. Now, the Queensland Ports Authority says that, there, that the port development has to be contained to those big five, but it, it says capital dredging for modelling, uh, for a new port can't occur anywhere else. It doesn't say a new port can't occur anywhere else. And the proposal for this port in a place called Bathurst Bay, which is a very isolated place, very high biodiversity, doesn't require dredging. So it does, go, it requires uh, transshipping coal dust, which is highly toxic on barges. It requires shipping traffic in key areas, but it could go under the wire because it doesn't require dredging. There's another port, proposed port, which was part of uh, the port of Gladstone, and it supports uh, an isolated population of less than uh, 100 dolphins. Uh, Daniel Cagnazzi's work showed that the port development was going to go right down the middle of the critical habitat. This port has been put on hold for the, the moment, and the federal minister says it, it won't happen. My reading of the port strategy is that it still could legally happen, so we have to watch this space. So now we have two species on the urban coast where um, where the outlook is not good. But it's not just about the urban coast. So high levels of protection and remoteness are not always enough. Now, Rain Island has to be, firstly, one of the most special places on the planet, but it's also one of the most highly protected places on the planet. You have to have a permit to go to Rain Island. It's a really long way offshore. And the story goes that Bob Hawke, soon after he ceased to be Prime Minister, w went with some of his mates to Rain Island and the brave ranger said, Mr Hawke, I'm very sorry, but your partner party cannot land because you don't have a permit. Anyway, Rain Island is the world's largest green turtle rookery. It's this highly protected place. It's the um, source of turtles for a huge re re uh, region. There are two problems. The first, and they're both natural. The first one is there's an estimated mortality of nesting turtles up to 2,000 a year which puts the indigenous harvest into shame, or, you know, <laughs> as very small beer in comparison to this, and, and people focus on the indigenous harvest. So this happens because the turtles are eroding the island effectively and they're falling off the cliffs. Um, and if you model sea turtles, this is quite serious because they're very long-lived, slow breeding, and the high reproductive value females are, are the population uh, is most sensitive to changes in this. The second thing that's happening is there's recruitment failure, and this is already evident in the genetic stock structure, uh, particularly in Torres Strait. So what is happening is that uh, too many eggs are being laid beneath the water table and they're killed. And so here we have nearly 400,000 eggs a night being laid in at the height of the season, and the figures for this year show that produced less than 3,000 hatchlings um, a few months later. And of course, of these hatchlings, less than one is going to grow up to be a reproductive turtle. It's a pro the geomorphology shows that it's a problem of sand redistribution, not sand production. So it's a natural thing as this, uh, due to the seasonal changes in the wind patterns 
uh, and, and the water patterns on the island, mainly, mainly the wave directions. It's probably happened many times before. Uh, turtles have only used this island for about 4,700 years, but of course the turtles are subject to a lot of other anthropogenic impacts now, and so the situation is, is very different from in the past. There are, as proof of concept, there have, has been some remediation done. You can move, we're very good at moving sand around beaches in Queensland and there's simple fences. So it, it is relatively easy to make a difference in the short term. But there's a looming problem of sand generation because the recent geomorphology shows that the large benthic forams contribute most of the sand in a very active uh, link between the reef flat and the sediment. And this, these animals are very sensitive to bleaching and ocean acidification. So, and there is also the problem of sea level rise. So Rain Island and the other coral caves like it are going to be very sensitive to short and long-term climate change. So what do I think about the future of marine megafauna? Well, the management to date, as people have explained, has largely been based on zoning and protecting against fishing impacts. I would like to say I don't think that's enough. I think, and I totally agree with Hugh, that we have to make some hard decisions here. We need to make some decisions about, probably about triage. I don't quite know how triage meets outstanding universal value, but that's an interesting debate. And I think we're going to need to decide on some places that need investment and protection. And I think, despite all that, climate change is likely to have a very serious impact on some populations, and Mariana Fuentes will be talking about that tonight. Thank you. <laughs>